Well, there are a number of things. Um, EMDR first recognizes the free association process and the importance that comes out of psychoanalysis. Um, EMDR also looks at the relationship between present symptoms and difficulties and their roots, antecedents in the past. Um, EMDR also has become to recognize the importance of the body, which has recently come much more out of psychoanalysis in the last 15 years or so, predominantly. It was known in, even in the 40s, but largely ignored. But now the body itself has become a more important piece of focus, both in EMDR and psychoanalysis. I think. For me, uh, in addition to EMDR, if I, psychoanalysis has always been the foundation. Um, now in the last 10 years, there has been so much neuroscience research for the first time, and every piece really points itself back to psychoanalysis, uh, especially relational psychoanalysis, intersubjective psychoanalysis. So I really do believe that you know, the, the two fields that really connect the best are relational intersubjective psychoanalysis and EMDR. Uh, you can also add a lot of the models that focus almost exclusively in the body, somatosensory psychotherapy, uh, somatic experiencing also have very important pieces that we can bring together in the end to make EMDR much more robust. What I have seen from the research that has been done, which has been in two groups, psychophysiology and then electroencephalography, MRI, spec scans and such, is that we see basically two things. Is that what EMDR seems to do, and it does it in steps, is that first it seems to quiet down the emotional system very much. And then what it does is it seems to repair the difficulties which are in the linkage of information in the brain and how the linkage works, which they call binding. Uh, and if you look at the research, because we have so many studies now which are pre-post and so many studies which are done throughout the EMDR session, both from electrophysiology, from neuroimaging, is that what we see is that basically what EMDR does is it, again, by working on the emotional circuitry and then the linkage circuitry, it seems to repair the problem. Now, I think we also have to understand that the only real data that we have is for type 1 PTSD. It's, you know, things like the attack of September 11th in New York, car accidents, tsunamis natural disasters, because there we have so much of the information. And there are a lot of other theories where people talk about it, that it helps it with memory, it, it helps, you know, with the emotional systems, and basically a lot of people are sort of looking at a piece of the puzzle, but what all the data does seem to show, and certainly we need more and more to be able to make a statement, is that it's, there is a simultaneous repair of emotional circuitry and linkage, information linkage circuitry. And if you can fix that, then basically all the other theories that people talk about, memory and such, they, and sleep and REM sleep, they all come together into that one model. ¿Cuáles son los resultados científicos más concluyentes con respecto a la relación entre los mecanismos neurofisiológicos presentes en el sueño y el reprocesamiento con MDR, especialmente en las etapas entre la 4 y las 6 eh, fases? Uh, which one are the scientific results more conclusive? Uh, in relation with the neurophysiologist mechanisms present in the sleep and, and in the reprocessing with the MDR? Well, actually, uh, there is, 
to the moment, really, there is no study that directly actually has been able to study mechanisms of REM because to study that, we don't yet even have the technology to really be able to do that. Uh, we have, with, no, with the neuroimaging, uh, most neuroimaging that's done is, let's say if you want to study REM sleep, you would look at this part of the brain is, is in hypoactivation, it's like it's sleeping, and this one is in hyperactivation, and this one is in normal activation. And that by itself doesn't tell you very much. Now there are new paradigms in imaging which are called neural connectivity, which is that the computer actually, whatever you're studying, in this case REM, would have to be able to look at the circuits that are involved, and at the same, which it would be fMRI. But what we also need is something like uh, MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which would be, need to look at the same time at neurotransmission. And we have that, but it's really, the level of it is like MRI was in the 1990s. So we don't yet have the machinery to be able to really look at REM by itself. Uh, there is one study, it's an Ellefson study and, and colleagues that was done in 2008. And the data that came from it was suggestive. There were some unusual things in terms of balances of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and they were so unusual that the only thing we understood is that only happens during REM sleep. Everything else was more suggestive of what we had before. So uh, that's the piece that's been very difficult. You know, it's been a very elegant model with Robert Stickgold, but we just don't have yet the facility to be able to examine it properly. ¿Cuál es tu formación psicoterapéutica inicial, el modelo, y cómo llegas al MDR? Which one is your psychotherapeutic uh, formation, initial formation, the model, and how do you get to EMDR? Historically. Okay. Well, when I came out of initially graduate school, I knew most, what most people know in most schools, it was cognitive behavioral, and I was working with difficult patients, and it, it wasn't sufficient. And so the next I went to was the psychoanalysis, and that really became my foundation, and in many ways continues to be my foundation. Um, in 1990, I began to use EMDR, and then the challenge was for me to integrate EMDR into psychoanalysis, which was, wasn't that difficult to do, and then somehow something changed in my mind, and EMDR sort of became the foundation for me. So then, what was actually easier was for me then to integrate psychoanalysis into EMDR. And from there, then I began to work with ego state therapy, which is basically also a psychoanalytic model. Uh, and so that came together. And from there, it was more, more and more body-oriented. Because as much EMDR talks a great deal about the body, there were other, other models that were exclusive, but they didn't have what EMDR had. But what was very easy to do was to take some of those pieces and then put that together with the MDR. So then somatosensory work and such things, really a hyper-focus on the body within psychoanalytic structure and within EMDR. And there are parts of psychoanalysis, especially projective identification, which now are being understood more and more, where the body now is very slowly becoming more and more important than the mind itself. Because now we're learning that emotions themselves are first in the body. And then the brain translates them, and we call them feelings. Although sometimes that gets confusing because that's what neuroscience says. And neuros the people who have studied neuroscience forgot that there was a psychoanalyst in the 60s, Sylvan Tompkins, 
who also understood the dynamic that affect, raw affect, was first in the body, but then he called it feelings, and then the brain translated and he called emotions. But those are just two words. The important piece, which is now becoming more understood, is that raw affect is in the body and all therapies have to go there first and foremost and then the other pieces that we've done still belong there but more and more has to be within the body so I began with psychoanalysis and everything else now brings me back into a full circle again which is kind of interesting ¿Qué aportó el modelo MDR a tu práctica clínica y al tipo de pacientes que conforman eh, tu consulta. What the model, EMDR model, eh, give you to the practical clinic and the type of clients that eh, make eh, your consultation? Well, I have a a colleague that's known in, in the uh, EMDR world, uh, Jim Knipe, who's been practicing EMDR for 27 years. And when he began lecturing about 20 years ago, he used to begin and he used to say, hello, my name is Dr. Jim Knipe, and I've been working with dissociation for the last 30 years, and the problem is I only realized it five years ago. And the reason I bring that up is that what EMDR did basically is take me more and more and more into trauma and more and more into complex trauma so that now if I look at who comes into my office 80% of the time it is really the most complex of traumas dissociative identity disorders other dissociative disorders and that has pretty much become the practice and occasionally something simple comes in <laughs> Gives me a little rest. <laughs> ¿Qué recomendaciones harías a los espacios de formación universitaria de grado acerca de la teoría del trauma, la disociación, el MDR en medicina y, y psicología? What recommendations would um, do to the formation university formation space? Uh, about the theory of trauma, dissociation, and the NDR in medicine and in psychology. Is the question really what, what more of it needs to come in or why it's not there? The biggest problem with first has to be with why isn't it there already? And because it's missing in the biggest universities in the world. And the biggest problem is that no one wants to really recognize, except the trauma specialist, that PTSD of all kinds, but especially complex, is now a complete world epidemic. And people can somewhat recognize it in terms of tsunamis and hurricanes. But what people refuse to understand is what the history of our planet has really caused. Centuries of colonialism, which produced constant traumas, century after century, and time really hasn't healed it, and people will just not look at that. And if they begin to look at that, then they realize that so much of the trauma is complex, And then that means that all kinds of abuse is basically can be found almost in every household because everyone at some level, I mean, it doesn't matter how many centuries have passed or unless they've had some therapy, that there is a history that they have with trauma. And people just won't recognize that. They don't recognize... You know, Sri Lanka had a 30-year civil war. 30 years. And no one can understand why men, women, and children are killing each other in the street. Nobody 
understands in America when they look at Native American, the Indians, and they say, what is wrong? Nobody wants to talk about the fact that once upon a time, the Europeans came to the United States and killed 90 million Indians. And nobody wants to recognize that as late as 1865, the United States had slavery. And everybody just once thinks that, well, time has passed and everything has gone away. And so there is this resistance to realize just how much trauma there is in the world. And so, and this happens in the highest levels of academic. To give you an example, I mean, Harvard University, Richard McNally, he's the chairman of psychiatry, who thinks that trauma exists, you know, in some section of a city where there are poor people. And so you have this, this prejudice and this blindness, and so the material doesn't come into the universities. It doesn't, and it needs to come in, maybe initially at the highest level in psychiatry, and then come more and more into the first years of the universities. But nobody really wants to recognize that when, if we talk about Ebola, or we talk about any of these, that this is much more rampant. Uh, I think that's basically what needs to be done and what stops it from being done. ¿Qué aprendizaje clínico le transmitirías a los jóvenes terapeutas que están iniciando su recorrido por EMDR? What clinical practice you will share to the young therapeutic that they are starting the way with EMDR. If I was teaching a new generation coming in, I mean, certainly I would teach most of what it is that we teach, but I think there are some things that we need to change and understand. EMDR began as a treatment for a certain kind of trauma, where, and the mo so the most important thing, the target of the treatment, was the trauma, which was the memory of the trauma. What we're learning though, we've seen it clinically and we're learning it now from neuroscience, is that it really isn't, that memory itself is not really the problem. That the problem is that information doesn't really link. For instance, someone can come into therapy and they talk about having been anxious and depressed their whole life, and you take a history, and they will start to talk about the fact that, you know, their, their parents beat them and yelled at them all the time. And they come to the conclusion that it must have been their fault. But what you notice as you begin to do treatment with them is that it doesn't take long for them to realize that maybe the problem wasn't really with me, that the problem was really with my parents. They had their problems and so on. So at this point, you've arranged the memory, and, but yet they still have their symptoms. The problem is, is that they began with a piece of information, which is, it was my fault and I'm a bad person. Now, maybe six months into therapy, they have a piece of information that says, it was my parents and their history and their suffering. Both pieces of information exist, but, and, what we see clinically, and now we, that we can see this now, especially with imaging, is that the information doesn't link together. And so, the one thing that I would add to this teaching is that memory is not the biggest issue. Everybody keeps talking about it, but it seems to be half, half of it is more, it's a tradition, this is what we've always done. So, at least theoretically, to really teach about linkage. Um, the other thing in my teaching would be to really make the body the focus. In other words, there's nothing that needs to be taken out of EMDR the way we teach it or the way we practice it, but there are things that need to be added. And that's the whole piece of especially the body, um, which is, so here in the teaching, we're talking about the body of the patient. What is now very new and yet very old, 
is an idea from 1946 that was, has been pretty much ignored. It's called projective identification, which is what is really going on in the therapist's body. And what we've learned is, and this is what I would really teach, is if, as therapists are doing what they're doing, if they're constantly paying attention to their own body, what they do is they will recognize sometimes a very nervous feeling, sometimes difficult con difficulty concentrating, sometimes you could have just had lunch and had four espressos, and all of a sudden you can't keep your eyes open. And the important piece is, is if we pay attention to that, we will notice within moments that that changes in us. And then if we pay really attention in about 10 minutes, we will notice that something changes in our patients. And this was ignored really since 1946. It was a concept from Melanie Klein, and it was ignored for two reasons. First, in 1946, psychoanalysis was trying to be, on one level, very scientific, although Freud said he didn't believe in research. But still, it was predominantly medical, Psychologists were just coming in at that point. And to sit there and discuss at a scientific meeting that the patient's material in their brain is projected to the patient's brain, it was just too much. So the academics ignored it. But if you think about it, if you take today's understanding and you're sitting there and then all of a sudden you either can't sit in your own skin or all of a sudden you can't stay awake, there is such a, a now a connection between your brain and the patient's brain or, and especially your own bodies. What, another reason why this has been ignored is that it scares people. If I can sit, it's one thing to sit in a room, you're the doctor, they're the patient, you know, what you're doing, they don't. Here, and this is what this intersubjective psychoanalysis is, which is we are now really working together. And if all of a sudden your patient's disturbance is now going on in you, in you, there is a natural reflex to just kind of ignore it. You know, you sit there, you pinch yourself, you do something. And so there's also this inner difficulty to literally put your mind together with the patient. And today, we, we understand that it's not, we're not projecting things back and forth. There's this whole new knowledge of mirror neurons, which is basically, if you watch somebody do something at a simple level, and if you looked at their brain, and then you did the same thing. Like if they were playing piano, and you just move your fingers on a piano, and you looked at your brain, your brain is actually doing the same thing. And if you look at that at more and more levels, patients can be overwhelmed, and then all of a sudden what goes on in their body is now simulated by your brain in your body, and that is simultaneously a wonderful discovery, and is also very frightening, and there's a resistance to it. So those are the pieces that if I, you know, if I was teaching today, um, I would really emphasize more, in addition to all the things that we've been doing up to now. ¿Qué falta para que los gobiernos nacionales, locales, tomen conciencia e, o inviertan en capacitar o formar al público de eh, hospitales públicos en salud mental en psicoterapia MDR? ¿Cómo es en tu país? What local national governments lack to take conscious and take time to, uh, to capacity the um, hospital, public hospital in mental health in uh, EMDR psychotherapy. How is in your country? The problems with bringing EMDR into the United States into big institutions, in other words, hospitals, the next big institution would be universities, although that's, there's more there. And then, for instance, into the military, like the, the veteran affairs hospitals. One of the biggest problems with that is now politics. 
and you have people like, for instance, uh, Dr. Edna Fowa, who is professor, University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League, prestigious, and she invented exposure therapy, and she's attached to it. She has other personal problems with the MDR that are more rumors than things, don't have to be discussed, but she, people like her, and she finds other people. She can find Richard McNally at Harvard and other people at other universities, and they basically help her, and what they do with their prestige, they basically keep EMDR out. And then when you ask the question, how could this be, then you will hear something like, there is no data on EMDR. And at this point, the, the only thing that has been studied more than EMDR is cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, there are, I mean, books and, or journals full of outcome studies in terms of how it works. We have now dozens of neurobiological studies, and it, it's politics. Um, people want to protect what they invented, and EMDR replaces many of the things they invented, especially exposure and, and CBT. Los protocolos especiales para disociación que aplicás, ¿cómo fueron construyéndose y variándose? The special protocol for dissociation um, that you use, how they were constructively and they didn't change. How they were constructed originally or within the... Uh, well, originally, uh, when it comes to dissociation, until you get to the middle of the 1980s, we knew nothing. And they were, um, at that time, trauma was studied by the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. And they were only in, mostly interested in tsunamis and wars and such things. So a number of their most prominent people former presidents, left in a friendly way, and they formed the International S uh, Society for the Study of Dissociation, which has now been changed International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. And these were big names, uh, Richard Cluft, Bessel van der Kolk, Bennett Brown, Cornelia Wilbur, and they began to, be, to create protocols and techniques to deal with dissociative identity disorder, which no one knew what to do with. And they began to publish, they began to present. Um, by the middle 90s, there were a number of us from the EMDR world who were sort of invited first, you know, to come there and listen, and then we were invited to speak. So there, there became a a clinical sort of marriage between those two worlds. Um, and so these techniques developed, and now many of them have also developed from people out of the EMDR community, who also are now part of that community, memberships in both. And basically, there have been more and more techniques that have been cross-fertilized. Uh, the things that I was talking about now the whole aspect of the body itself has now come into both organizations because basically those are the two organizations that really teach uh, how to deal with dissociation. Pretty much a lot of it until recently was more predominantly the ISSTD, but at this point I think there are members of the EMDR communities, whether it's EMDRIA, US EMDR, EMDR Europe, EMDR Asia, are now becoming more and more, and it's become pretty much an equal piece of, uh, they seem to do more of the research, we seem to do more of the clinical development, it's become sort of a nice teamwork. And that seems to be, those are the two places where most of the learning is done. Uh, and until recently, it was very difficult to get a book published. Uh, it wasn't until 2008, from the EMDR world that Carol Forgash was able to publish a book where about 
12 of us wrote chapters. And now it's been sort of good because Springer Publishing seems to have taken a real liking to EMDR, to trauma and dissociation. So now there are very good opportunities. If you have a good idea, there is now a publisher willing, instead of having to fight the politics and people used to write you know, submissions and told, this is wonderful, but we can't print it politically. So all of that has changed and it seems to be growing really nicely. ¿Cuáles son los cuidados especiales que, como terapeuta especializado en poblaciones con disociación, tienes que tener en cuenta para poder trabajar reprocesando aún con pacientes desregulados emocionalmente, es decir, por fuera de la ventana de tolerancia? What, uh, which one are the special cares you, as a therapist, Specialized in dissociation, have a need with dissociation. Sorry. Podemos empezar la pregunta de nuevo en inglés. Which one are the special cares you, as a special therapist in dissociation people, have to take care to reprocess even with desregulated emotionally clients, it means out of the window of tolerance. Which are the clients or which, which is the way to try to work with it? Both? Yeah. Well, the most difficult clients, we can, we can call them by different diagnostic names, dissociative identity disorders, mid to low functioning borderline personalities, which in many ways I think is the same thing. One is an axis one diagnosis, one is an axis two diagnosis. Uh, those are the most difficult cases. Um, they take the most amount of preparation before you can begin EMDR targeting. Um, and what I have found myself is that one of the things is to basically have them become much, much more aware of their own bodies. If the other piece is to work with uh, ego states, if we're not talking about DID, and alters, if we are talking about DID, uh, to spend long amounts of time, because that becomes a stabilization and a resourcing. Um, what I have found personally is also to bring in aspects of traditional Chinese medicine and, and to work within uh, energy fields, um, because those kind of interventions will, especially in the beginning, make very big differences. And I think in many ways, I mean, certainly in the United States, this is one of the oldest systems of medicine and it's, it's being recognized, but very slowly recognized and with resistances everywhere towards using it more and more. ¿Cómo fue tu experiencia aplicando MDR en poblaciones con trastornos mentales severos? Por ejemplo, esquizofrenia. How was uh, experience uh, using EMDR um, with mental uh, population with severe cases like schizophrenia? I think, um, I mean now, the, since 2004, there have been really two wonderful books that have been written about uh, schizophrenia. And the first thing we, many of us have to learn um, is to un unlearn what we've learned about schizophrenia because there's very little data. There's very little data that it's a genetic disorder. Uh, in fact, all the data, we haven't been able to localize a gene, but the gold standard has been what are called uh, 
monozygotic twin concordance trials, which is you find a family that has schizophrenics that has one, at least one set of identical twins, another set of fraternal twins, and then you, and you make these comparisons. And for the last 40 years, there have been dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Now, for instance, if you look at eye color, if you do those studies, you will see what's called 100% concordance. If you do it with race. If you do it with medical illnesses that have been studied, Tay-Sachs disease, Huntington's chorea, cystic fibrosis, you also see 100% concordance. Now that has been the limit. You could do 98% concordance. If you look at everything about schizophrenia, the highest that we had until the last 10 or 12 years was 30%. And now that the designs are better, the computers are better, we see 22%. That means that 25 to 26% of schizophrenia is genetic. That means that almost 80% is not genetic. If we look back at what was written by Eugen Bloiler, basically what he, he described hundreds and hundreds of cases. And 80% of those cases were very complex PTSD. There were 20% cases where he said, there seems to be a thought disorder, we have no idea what to do, we have no medication. But for the most part, it was trauma. And then all of a sudden, everybody just ignored it. And it became this genetic endogenous disorders. For many of us, in 2004, a book was written by Colin Ross, who basically was the first one to expose all of this. And the word basically was, and he's one of the leaders of um, ISSTD, is now also now very big in the EMDR community. And the first message was, take a better history, these people have traumas. So right away, now, in terms of treatment, you're, you, you now do treatment for complex PTSD. It was also logical, but everybody would ignore the fact that being schizophrenic in any, well, in our world, is a trauma by itself. And so there we've already had models that many of us have used for a good, at least a, a decade and a half, that have worked. Now, Paul Miller's book has just come out, and what, what he explores are all of these things that we've known and done, and the, the new thing that Paul has seen, is, and again, this is what shows you that it's not memory that causes these problems, but really what you believe. You know, so for instance, as much as we talk about memory in EMDR, the core belief that negative cognition of EMDR really, in many ways, really should be the center. And you can take that application, and this is what Paul has been writing, and since he's been writing, I mean, it's a new book. Those of us, myself, I had the privilege of discussing the book as Paul was writing it, uh, and then very fortunate to write a forward in it. But when he talked about that sometimes you could just, patient could tell you that there are worms and, you know, avocados growing in their stomach. You could ask a question about why do you believe that, and they would give you an answer. And instead of just thinking this is psychotic foolishness, that you would actually just focus on that. Focus on the core belief, and then you can ask the rest of the EMDR questions. And Paul began to notice that his patients were getting better. And then the rest of us who started to play with this are beginning to notice the same things. So basically, to bring it all together for schizophrenia, going from the simple to the most complex, being schizophrenic is already a traumatic situation, so you have something to treat with basic EMDR. Then, for the majority of these cases, if you take a history, and this is the thing, people would never take a history. Uh, they would ask them, do you hear voices, which you actually are supposed to hear, and immediately they would say, they're schizophrenics. So then if you, if you have a complex trauma history, well, now you have a very long-term treatment already, 
And then if you have hallucinations or you have delusions and you just ask, why do you think there are artichokes growing in your stomach? They will give you an answer. You just focus on that. And so it opens the door to schizophrenia. It will probably open the door, the same thing, to bipolar 1, which is a psychotic process. I mean, bipolar 2 seems to be complex PTSD. But especially for schizophrenia, these two particular books, if everybody else reads them and wakes up, will open the door to hundreds of thousands of people who basically were denied clinically treatment. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuri Berman, for sharing with us all your experience using NDR uh, in population very severe.